Good evening, everyone. Not a break yet. Dinner will be coming soon with a lot of other fabulous speakers and amazing rays of light in the darkness. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Laurie Regan, and I'm the vice chair and the New York chapter president of the Endowment for Middle East Truth. Thank you. Well, I am so happy to, oh, well, I'm sorry. Well, I'm so happy to be back here with all of you, celebrating Emmett's critically important work and recognizing this evening's rays of light in the darkness honorees who join a distinguished list of prior recipients. The occasion is also feeling bittersweet to me. On the one hand, I am proud and honored to have been affiliated with Sarah Stern and Emmett, working together over the past 15 years or so and achieving so many important accomplishments. But on the other hand, these past few months since the horrors of October 7th have only proven to me how much more work is left to be done. It's, it's a bit daunting. If it wasn't obvious prior to now, it is plain to see how important Emmett is in the battle for the Jewish people and Israel's survival, and more broadly, for the survival of Western civilization as we know it. I do not say that lightly. It took the horrific butchering of 1,400 Israelis and the kidnapping of about 240 for the world to wake up to the fact that the barbarians are, in fact, at the gates. They are coming for all of us, and they are waging a multi-front war. Israel is battling militarily on the first front, but Emmett has been fighting on the second front, the cognitive war, for decades. I fear the second front is proving to be the more difficult to win, which makes our work that much more important. The brilliant Charles Krathammer, a blessed memory, who was a previous rays of light in the, yes, let's clap. <laughs> who we all miss tremendously, and he was a previous rays of light in the darkness recipient. He once recognized that, quote, the persistence of anti-Semitism, that most ancient of, of poisons, is one of history's greatest mysteries. Even the shame of the Holocaust proved no antidote. It proved but a temporary respite. Anti-Semitism is back. Alas, a new gener generation must learn to confront it. Like Dr. Krauthammer, Emmett has, for two decades, recognized the growing scourge of anti-Semitism that has taken over our college campuses and infected many of our mainstream institutions, from corporate boardrooms and mainstream media outlets to the halls of Congress and, frighteningly, the Democrat Party. Today's anti-Semitism was not easily recognized by many as it was disguised as anti-Zionism, with claims by its proponents that criticisms of Israel, they're not Semitic, anti-Semitic, excuse me. But calls on college campuses and our city streets and town squares of from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Go back to the ovens. You belong in the ovens. Jews belong in the ovens. Hitler didn't finish the job. We need to finish the job. And F the Jews, gas the Jews, are not new for those of us who have been working in this space. They're just now more common. They're being shared more loudly and finally being covered by the mainstream media. They can no longer be ignored. Or can they? And this is where Emmett comes in. We have been working on the Hill for many, many years in an effort to ask legislators to address the growing anti-Semitism that we see here at home. But we've also worked very hard to educate our policymakers to understand the importance of Israel's survival to America's national security, as well as the West more generally. We work with legislators on both sides of the aisle, and our efforts together with the bipartisan work of congressmen like Representatives Torres and Lawler to pass the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act in the House exemplifies the results of what we can do and what we do do. Thank you, Congressman. But the most important thing at the moment is ensuring that our policymakers on both sides of the aisle understand that America must stand with Israel. October 7th changed the world. Israel now needs the United States more than ever on both battlefields. Frighteningly, as October 7th moves further into the rearview mirror, support for Israel is waning. Democrats are now talking about conditioning aid to Israel as if Israel is a third world dictatorship. And earlier today, 105 Democrats failed to support a House resolution condemning anti-Semitism. The Hamas lobby is organized, pressuring policymakers with their street demonstrations and nonstop phone calls to congressional offices and promoting a new movement that they're calling hashtag Abandon Biden. And sadly, the Biden administration is succumbing to the political pressure, dictating Israel's war plans and limiting its ability to do what it has to do to defend itself and its citizens. 
The international community is threatening Israel's survival with lies, blood libels, and condemnations of the only Jewish state which has the most moral army in the history of the world, fighting a war it neither asks for nor that it wishes to engage in. But it has no choice, and Emmett works to ensure that decision makers are educated on these complicated issues from defending UNRWA, as we've just heard from Senator Blackburn, and the PA to enforcing the Taylor Force Act and halting Iran's terrorist and nuclear aspirations. Thank you, Congressman Torres, for your comments on that. We ensure that Americans understand that without a strong U.S.-Israel relationship, which must remain a priority of our national security policies, Israel will not survive. Without Israel, no Jew is safe. Without Israel, Western civilization is doomed. Wars aren't won in days, weeks, months, or even years. The war for the survival of the Jewish people has persisted for thousands of years, and only God knows when it will, and when it will end. But until then, it is our duty, our responsibility as Jews, to take up the, ma the mantle of those who preceded us on these battlefields and fight our enemies who are growing in number, hubris, audacity, strength, and force. It is not clear what will happen after the fighting ends, but Emmett will never rest. We will never become complacent, and we will fight until the war against Jew hatred is won, which is where you all come in. I support Emmett because I recognize it as an integral part of the war plan that will help Israel win on both battlefields, and we cannot do our work without your support. Not everyone can be a soldier on the front lines like Sarah. But there have been roles for civilians to play in times of war. And everyone here tonight can be a soldier in the cognitive war. You can spread the word about Emmett and the important work that we do. Host a parlor meeting, forward our newsletter far and wide, sponsor a webinar, and share the recordings of our webinars, which feature many of the world's leading national security experts, several of whom are here sharing the evening with us tonight. But most importantly, we need you to open your wallets just one more time this year to help us continue our vital work. Israel needs those of us in the diaspora to fight what I believe is the longer and more difficult war that will continue well after the cessation of the current military offensive, the battle for the hearts and minds of global citizenry, and most importantly, for a met, the truth. We are living through historic times and perilous times. We are facing a clash of civilizations of the highest magnitude, and our policymakers must understand the implications for every decision they make on the national security front in order to ensure that good triumphs over evil. Emmett is helping to bring moral clarity to American foreign policy, which is needed now more than ever. We all must stand with Israel and take action because passivity will no longer work, for if not us, who will stand up and protect Israel? To circle back to Dr. Krauthammer's words, we, ladies and gentlemen, and our children and our grandchildren are that new generation that must step up to confront the recurrence of the lethal disease known as anti-Semitism, as well as anti-Israel, anti-America, and anti-Western hate, and to bring truth to the public square that has otherwise been invaded by vile and false narratives. Without truth, anti-Semitism will continue to flourish, attacks on Jews the world over will continue to escalate, and Israel's ability to survive will become more and more precarious. Please do your part as a soldier in this vital fight for Israel's survival and that of the Jewish people in the West. Please help, help Emmett continue its critically important work. Donation cards have been placed in each of your program uh, on, on the tables, and. Uh, volunteers, I believe, will be walking around or they can be left uh, when, you, when you depart tonight. Please help us fight another day. As we celebrate Hanukkah and study the story of Joseph in the coming week's Parsha, it is in the spirit of Joseph's faith and humility that Jews must continue to carry on amidst all the existential challenges surrounding us throughout the world. It is our faith in God that gives us the power to have faith in ourselves as the chosen people to carry on and to maintain our confidence in our God and in ourselves, to perpetuate the power of the Jewish people, to maintain that light that shone so brightly for eight nights, and to carry that light and our people into the future. I thank you, and I wish you all Chag Sameach, God bless, and Am Yisrael Hai. Thank you, thank you.
Okay, yeah. So for those, this is, this is the um, donation card at your table. I, again, please, anything you all can do. We need to keep up this fight now more than ever. Um, I'm now going to uh, introduce one of Israel's best friends in Congress and a true patriot fighting for Western values in America's security and prosperity. It's my honor, Congressman Mike Lawler, to introduce you, you represent New York's 17th Congressional District, which includes parts of Westchester County, where I live. I'm, a, I'm actually thinking how ironic it is that I live in like this crazy part of Westchester, and Emmett is honoring two of Israel's best friends from my, that are neighbors. Um, Congressman Lawler, I have to make this personal and just share how sad I am that you were not my representative. My representative is one of the most virulent anti-Israel members of the squad, Jamal Bowman. I've thought about running against him, but I'm told a Republican can't win. Um, but I do wish I lived in your district. Congressman Lawler began his political career in the New York State Assembly, where he passed more bills than any other member of his conference, a testament to his bipartisan and pragmatic approach to government. He has taken that approach to Congress, where he serves on the House Financial Services Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. During his tenure and on U.S. national security issues, Congressman Lawler has recognized the challenges that we face from our, the growing list of adversaries, including China, Russia, North Korea, and of course, Iran, and the dangers that they pose to our interests around the globe. But since the outbreak of the war that Hamas began on October 7th, Congressman Lawler has been exemplary standing up for Israel and fighting anti-Semitism. He has issued a number of very powerful and principled statements since the war, including a condemnation of Rashida Tlaib and her fellow squad members, propagating Hamas lies about the Al-Ahli Arab hospital bombing in Gaza, in which he, you stated, Congressman, it is appalling and unacceptable that Democrats in Congress partook in Hamas's misinformation campaign, which falsely accused the Israel Defense Forces of bombing a hospital in Gaza. The fact that Representative Tlaib and her colleagues in the squad are unable to bring themselves to condemn Hamas, an international terrorist organization, for these actions shows they are unfit to serve in the United States Congress. And, and he added, moreover, Hamas's lies, amplified by my Democratic colleagues, have led to disgusting and rampant anti-Semitism both at home and abroad. It's sickening to see the level of hate espoused by anti-Semites, and it has gotten to the point where our Jewish friends and neighbors are scared to walk in the city, call an Uber, or post on social media. Congressman Lawler also sponsored the recent legislation affirming Israel's right to exist, which passed the House floor almost unanimously as he recognized that, and again I quote, Israel is the only multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, and multi-religious democracy in the Middle East. They are a beacon of hope, freedom, and opportunity. Tonight, Congress reaffirmed our support for the state of Israel, the right to exist, and the right of the Jewish people to live peacefully in their native land. I could go on. But I've spoken long enough, and we all want to hear from Congressman Lawler. Thank you, Congressman. You are a true ray of light in the darkness. And on behalf of the Endowment for Middle East Truth, we thank you for your moral clarity and unwavering commitment to the security of both America and Israel. Well, good evening. I know you're all very disappointed that America's most famous Jewish member of Congress, George Santos, could not be here tonight. <laughs> so instead, you'll have to settle for an Irish-Italian Catholic from New York. <laughs> Mom, Dad. I just killed 10 Jews with my bare hands. Mom, Dad, I just killed 10 Jews with my bare hands. Those are the words that I heard when I traveled to Israel three weeks ago to meet with Prime Minister Netanyahu, Defense Minister Gallant, U.S. Ambassador Jack Lew, and a bipartisan congressional delegation. We heard glee 
in the voice of a young man calling his parents in Gaza to tell them that he just killed 10 Jews with his bare hands. Not Israelis, but Jews. His parents praising Allah, proud. He wasn't born that way, he was taught that. He was taught to hate Jews. I watched in horror for 21 minutes, unedited raw footage of the October 7th terrorist attack. It makes anything you would see in a Hollywood movie pale in comparison. Women, children, babies, slaughtered, shot, beheaded, burned. A father trying to protect his two young sons died when a grenade was thrown at him. The two young boys running back in the house, screaming, crying. The Hamas terrorist comes in after them, opens the refrigerator, pulls out a soda, and starts drinking from it. The depraved indifference, the vile, disgusting, barbaric conduct, that's what we watched. I didn't look away. Every American should see it. Because if every American saw that, there would not be one person calling for a ceasefire. When I hear my colleagues call for a ceasefire, it is mind-numbing. There have been eight ceasefires in the last 15 years, each time violated by Hamas, including just last week. The fact that we have members of Congress who cannot bring themselves to clearly and unequivocally condemn Hamas including one member somehow trying to explain away rape. I meant it when I said it. These people are unfit to serve. This isn't about party, because I just gladly threw George Santos' ass out of Congress. We are dealing in a world where facts don't matter, truth doesn't matter, conduct doesn't matter. Hamas is a terrorist organization that needs to be eradicated, period. You know, when we censured Rashida Tlaib, I said in my speech, America the Beautiful sings about from sea to shining sea. That's aspirational. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free is not. Because what it's calling for is the eradication of the Jewish state. What it's calling for is the elimination of the Jewish people. And to be clear, she knew exactly what she was saying when she said it. If we are going to crack down on the rapid anti-Semitism that is permeating every institution of higher learning, in K through 12 schools, 
then we must start by holding our elected officials accountable. Which is why it was important to censure Rashida Tlaib. Which is why it was important to put on the House floor the other day a resolution that made very clear Israel has a right to exist. Because the truth is, the attacks of October 7th were based on one fundamental belief, the belief by Hamas, the belief shared by Hezbollah, the belief promulgated by Iran, that Israel does not have a right to exist. That's their worldview. That is why the terrorist attacks of October 7th occurred. And so, to me, this is very simple. Number one, not only must Congress reaffirm Israel's right to exist, which it did, but we can have an immediate and lasting ceasefire. It's very simple. Hamas must surrender. There is no moral equivalency between Israel and Hamas. Israel is our greatest ally in the world. Israel is a beacon of hope, of freedom, of democracy. It is the only multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious democracy in the Middle East. It's not an apartheid state. It's not an oppressor. The only ones oppressing the Palestinian people are Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. <laughs> Hamas uses its own people, the Palestinian people, as human shields. The Palestinian Authority engages in pay to slay. To this day, it continues to pay Palestinians to kill Jews. So when you hear that young man call his parents to say, Mom, Dad, I just killed 10 Jews with my bare hands, that's not by happenstance or by accident. They are taught that. They are taught that at a young age that it's acceptable to hate Jews, and not only hate Jews, but kill Jews. This administration has been weak when it comes to taking on the Palestinian Authority and Iran. They stopped enforcing the Taylor Force Act which made clear that the Palestinian Authority would not get any funds so long as they engaged in pay-to-slay policies. They're still doing it, and yet they're getting funds. Iran, the greatest state sponsor of terror, funds Hamas and Hezbollah and other terrorist organizations using the proceeds from the sale of Iranian petroleum. Since Joe Biden took office, the sale of Iranian petroleum is up 59%. Why? Because they stopped enforcing the secondary sanctions enacted by the prior administration. That is why I was proud, along with Jared Moskowitz, a Democrat from Florida, to introduce the SHIP Act, 
which would enact secondary sanctions on the greatest purchaser of Iranian petroleum, China. The unholy alliance between China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea is a threat to democracy. It is a threat to the free world. They have sought to undermine, disrupt, attack, and destabilize the free world. They must be held accountable. When the SHIP Act was on the floor, there were members of Congress running around the floor. I watched it. I listened to it. Running around the floor saying, we can't support this. This is a Republican attempt to increase domestic production of oil by increasing oil costs in the Middle East. Are you out of your minds? First of all, we don't purchase nor refine Iranian petroleum. China does. The objective here was to limit the proceeds of the sale of Iranian petroleum so that Iran can stop using it to fund terrorism. So when you look at what is happening around the globe, we need to be clear-eyed. We need to be resolute. This is a battle of good versus evil. When we went to Israel three weeks ago, we had to fly through London. The Department of Defense would not take us, and the State Department would not allow us to stay overnight. So we had to stay in London. We took a red eye to London, slept for an hour in the hotel, and then we went to lunch in the hotel. 500,000 pro-Hamas protesters marched right by the hotel as we were eating lunch. Oblivious. Now, many of these folks protesting don't seem to realize that if they themselves were in Gaza, they would be murdered and killed and pushed off the top of a building for who they are. We then, after lunch, went and toured Churchill's war room. And obviously saw a lot of the history of Winston Churchill. But we also got to see the lead up to World War II and the Holocaust. And in that moment, it was very clear to me, as it should be to every member of Congress, that we cannot afford to be a bunch of Neville Chamberlains. We must be a bunch of Winston Churchill's victory at all cost. So we flew on a red eye that night to Tel Aviv, got to the hotel, slept for about an hour, and then went and met with the U.S. ambassador and our CIA station chief and got a update on what was happening on the ground. And then we went and met with Prime Minister Netanyahu. And he played for us at the beginning of the meeting the 21 minute video. Now I was in Israel back in May with Speaker McCarthy. We were there to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Israel as Israel's longest and strongest friend, Harry Truman, having recognized Israel 11 minutes after its founding, it was important for the United States to show our support. Speaker McCarthy spoke before the Knesset, only the second speaker in the history of the United States to do so. And when we met with Prime Minister Netanyahu, we talked about two very important things. Number one, 
preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, and number two, normalizing relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. During the trip, at every meeting, I took the opportunity to speak about a piece of legislation that I had introduced, along with my colleague from the Bronx, Richie Torres. <clears throat> The bill would create a special envoy for the Abraham Accords. I talked about it so much, my colleagues on the trip made fun of me. And they made fun of me because I kept bringing up Richie Torres, even though he wasn't on the trip. They got a little jealous. But Richie and I worked on this bill because we understood the importance of it. The Abraham Accords is probably the most important foreign policy initiative in the last many decades. Because in order to bring about peace in the Middle East, we must normalize relations between Arab-majority countries and Israel. In order to ensure shared prosperity, there must be cooperation. And we understood that in order to really do this right, you needed somebody focused on that goal at the State Department as an ambassador rank and working on it 24-7. Bibi Netanyahu said he supported it. President Herzog said he supported it. Ambassador Herzog said he supported it. Speaker Ohana said he supported it. Three weeks later, when we got back, the bill was passed through the House of Representatives. Legislation can be critically important because it's not just about making statements, it's not just about passing resolutions, it's actually about solving problems. And if we want to solve the problem in the Middle East, it comes down to one thing. Arab majority nations must accept a simple truth. Israel has a right to exist. We have spent a lot of time this year and effort on our support for Israel, and justifiably so. But it is not just about defending Israel. It is about combating the rabid anti-Semitism that is happening across America. It's why in May, after that vile CUNY Law School graduation speech, I introduced the Stop Anti-Semitism on College Campuses Act. What it would do is pretty simple. It would strip federal funds, including student aid, from every single institution of higher learning that promotes or sanctions anti-Semitism on their college campuses. Why? Because the only thing these folks seem to understand is when their endowment gets hurt. Now, the second piece of legislation that I introduced on this issue just a few weeks ago with Congressman Josh Gottheimer and Jared Moskowitz and Max Miller was the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. What it would do is require the Department of Education to adopt the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism and its contemporary examples for all of its discrimination enforcement actions. It is critically important that we root out this vile anti-Semitism at its core. 
education is vital. It's why, as a member of the state legislature in New York, when the Democratic chairman from the Bronx of the Education Committee, Mike Benedetto, tried to kill a bill that would require the Department of Education in the state to conduct a study about whether or not the Holocaust was being taught in our schools and what materials were being used. I led the debate in the Education Committee. All of the Republicans voted to override his motion to table the bill. And we convinced five Democrats to join us. That doesn't happen in Albany. But the issue was so important. And his position made no sense. Because when we talk about never again, it shouldn't just be a slogan. There should be action associated with it. And it starts with education. It starts with making sure that our children understand anti-Semitism, racism, bigotry, hatred of any kind are not acceptable. And so we, pa we overrode the chair. The bill came to the floor a few months later. It passed unanimously and got signed into law. And I can tell you, we are in the process of holding the Department of Education accountable to make sure that every K through 12 school in New York State is upholding the rule of law and they are teaching about the Holocaust and they are using the materials that are appropriate. As we move forward, we have to deal with these issues holistically. I and Richie are fully committed to doing that. This isn't a Republican or Democratic issue. We all have to be willing to hold everyone accountable if we are going to combat anti-Semitism and stop Jew hatred. So I'll, I'll conclude by saying, as a representative of one of the largest Jewish communities in America, the 17th Congressional District of New York, and as the adopted representative for Jewish residents in the 16th Congressional District of New York. You, you can share Richie and I, it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll co-parent. Um, it is critically important, it is critically important that we are unified in this effort, that we address the challenges here in America and that we stand by our greatest ally, the State of Israel. You have, you have my full commitment and my unwavering support. I will never bend or yield on this. We will make sure that Israel has the support that it needs, financially, militarily, and here in the Washington to defend its right to exist, to defend its right to defend itself, and to defend the right of the Jewish people to practice their faith freely and peacefully. I'm Israel High. God bless.